and we are live. Happy Thursday, Sober Nation. It's great to be back here on another Thursday night um, talking about, we're talking about love and relationships and recovery. And tonight we have a very special guest on. Um, Veronica is not here. She's actually celebrating Valentine's Day with her hubby. Um, so we <laughs> asked a question last night of who would like to co-host um, the Facebook Live with me. And our good friend Tom over here. Um, Hi, everybody. Yep, yeah, this is Tom. How's it going, Tom? Fantastic. Awesome. I'm so, on the side of the country, but we'll be all right. Yeah, yeah. So Tom's all the way in Tacoma, Washington. Um, so we're, uh, we're in two different time zones. Um, so happy Valentine's day, first of all, how, so Tom, you've been, you've watched Sober Nation for a while. Tell me a little bit about your story and, and how you got involved in recovery and, and let, let's hear it. I'll give you the short synopsis of it. Cause we don't have that much time, but, uh, uh my story pretty much had a pretty rough upbringing. Um, a lot of post-traumatic stress issues related to that chose the wrong coping mechanisms to deal with all of that type of stuff led to uh, 17 years as being a drug addict, which started out with some of the lighter things and evolved into heroin and methamphetamine and those type of things. Several state charges levied against me. Um, went through all that, all the hoops and uh, clinical operations and all that stuff. Uh, 17 years, spent some time homeless on the streets as a result of my addiction. Uh, several bottoms, couple overdoses, all that type of stuff. Um, then when I got in a relationship spiritually, uh, things kind of changed. That's where the rubber made the road. I got really involved in uh, recovery work with uh, Youth for Christ, which is a center that focuses on working with at-risk children that are from abused homes. And then I started working also with a Union Gospel Mission, wow. um, working with street-level ministry and people that are homeless with dual diagnosis issues. And then eventually meandered over my way to Tacoma. And now I'm blessed to say that I'm a part of a Bayview Recovery, which is a dual diagnosis healthcare facility. I'm actually the program director for the outfit. Um, so I get the pleasure of shaping the program for several of those coming into recovery fresh from the streets. So, wow. So you've really yeah. been on both sides of it, you know, I mean, entirely truly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you're yeah. definitely a success story. And like, I love, I love just having like people on that, um, like you that really have, have been on both sides of it and, and know exactly, you know, what it's like. I mean, like most of us, but, um, so I'm just going to say hi real quick to Geraldine. Hi, Geraldine, Chuck, Casey, um, and Casey. Perfect. So, and Patrick, Patrick says God is great. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> so we're talking about, um, you know, relationships and love in recovery. Um, and today's Valentine's day. And, you know, no matter if you're single or in a relationship, I feel like today is just an important reminder for self-love to practice acts of love towards those the people who we appreciate, who we love. And, um, you know, when we do get sober, most of our relationships are strained, right? I know me, like all of mine were, you know, all my bridges were burned and I carried so much self-hate for so long and my self-worth was so shitty. And so, you know, I mean, really, how do we start to change that? Well, I mean, what do you think, Tom? Uh, that's an interestingly loaded question. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, it ties into the values of self-worth, how, how you identify yourself, your yeah. self-perception, which is uh, unfortunately, especially in today's day and age, uh, shaped by society and experience. Mm -hmm. um, and not a lot of our experiences have been good, especially uh, those that come from a substance abuse background. So breaking free of that, uh, a lot of the stigmas that society has around, like, for example, myself, a convicted felon and a drug addict, those are some hard stigmas to overcome. Sure. So how do you overcome that with self-worth and self-love? Um, for me personally, it was a spiritual pursuit uh, to relearn how to love myself. I had to stop believing what I thought about me and what others thought about me. And I personally started believing in what God says about me mm. um, rather than what society says about me. So that was able... For me personally, that was where I was able to get detached from the point of seeking validation from other human beings, as yeah. far as whether or not I'm a decent human being in person. And I guess that's where my uh, journey of self-love started. Hmm. So I know that's different for everybody, though. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, I was at just 
a such a low point that really like I was like, why not give it a try? You know, um, it's it's so uncomfortable, like starting to feel those things about yourself and um, starting to change that type of thinking. But obviously, like our drug addiction or alcoholism did not take overnight to get to. Right. So it doesn't take overnight to uh, get back to that state where we a like are willing to start accepting ourselves and be to start being okay with who we are in our own skin, you know? Um, so, I mean, and, and what are, I mean, what are some of the things that you do, I guess, to practice self love? Because I think it's so important, you know, I mean, you work in the field, I do too. And, you know, it's always, we're always on the grind and always trying to do the next right thing, trying to help everybody. And um, sometimes like we get, we like even just, anyone i mean we can get so burnt out and um what what do you what do you do me personally i like to take times to enjoy the small things which includes uh mm -hmm. when you go through the process of rebuilding yourself that's redefining what are your passions what are you interested in doing uh how much satisfaction there's things in this world that money can't buy um mm -hmm. i know from experience so that being said, I like to pursue those things because you can't gain them from any type of monetary thing like serving other people. So uh, I feel like yeah. for me personally, the best way to combat depression and anxiety, uh, things of that nature is to step outside of yourself and serve others. So, you know, you're leaving truly a good legacy in this world um, and leading by example. Those things for me in some weird way is a way of showing self-love because it's basically bolstering mm -hmm. my own self-worth that like I'm living for a purpose right. far beside just myself. Right, right. And um, Dee Dee says, thank you for sharing your story, Tom. Thank you for all that you do for those still sick and suffering. Happy Valentine's Day. So Happy Valentine's Day to you as well. And Patrick has been sober for 29 years. Congratulations, Patrick. That's amazing. That's like that's a lifetime. I mean, for, you know, some people, it's a lifetime. Um, so, and so, yeah, it's Valentine's Day. Love in recovery. I mean, someone just said that, hold on, let me go to it. Um, after your first year is recommended. So I've heard this a lot and I've heard, you know, very mixed things when I was getting sober. Someone told me, you know, don't start dating until you're a year sober because you have had problems with men or whatever in the past. Someone said, you know, it's really up to you. Um, and personally, I think that it is dependent on what the person's past behaviors looked like. Um, what, what do you think about that? Well, uh, I the, so the, I think that idea is built upon the fact that you can't fully love somebody else or commit to somebody else unless right. you've learned how to love yourself first. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, you can't give away something that you don't have, and that includes self-love. Um, so read the, I'm assuming that that's a reason. Well, not to mention those coming from a substance abuse background. We have right. a lot of issues with codependency and unhealthy relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, they go hand in hand. Uh, as well as relapse, because you're talking about somebody that has a predisposition to uh, how they respond to things emotionally. So when those relationships break up or go south or go sideways, it usually ends up being a rationalization or a justification for them to go back out and use. Um, so I'm assuming all those reasons combined would be a good good precursor as to why that's, uh, why that's a thing and why it's said in NA and AA and, and other types of support groups of that nature. Right. Right. Um, they bring it up the 13th step <laughs> and want to stay away from them for, uh, you know, a good solid year. But that's because you're spending that time to focus on you so you can learn about, I guess, yourself. Uh, one of the things I figured are that I've uh, come across is that <clears throat> being an addict is so narrow minded in its perspective that you don't mm -hmm. really put others needs ahead of your own ever. Like so right. when you get sober, you're rediscovering who you are as an individual which includes like a lot of mistakes that you made in past relationships and things like that. Uh, how you want to treat others, how you want to be treated in that journey of self-exploration. You almost put that on hold if you jump in a relationship right away. Right. And I think too, you know, I mean, substituting one thing, one addiction, I mean, can be another person, you know, when we, when we put down the drugs, the alcohol, and we start putting those other people's needs before ourselves, that's exactly what we did when we were using. I mean, uh, we did anything and everything to get our next fix, you know? So um, it's, it's kind of like the same thing, you know, and I, you know, you, you get a high from it. Um, 
So James says two months for me, new in recovery. And these have been so helpful for me in understanding my recovery, James. We're so glad you're here. We hope you join us again. Um, Jesse says, I got sober while in a relationship. We got sober together, though. So it made a big difference for me. I don't know if I would be marrying him had he not gotten sober with me. That's an interesting one because, you know, I it's that that's very rare. And congratulations to you, Jesse, sure. because, you know, people who use together and get sober together, that's really hard. I mean, I've um, come across a few people that have done that and and a lot of them don't either end up splitting up or. Um, you know, going one goes back out, one stays back in. So props to you. Um, and then, yeah, well, I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, statistically speaking, <laughs> should definitely be on the lower end. Yeah. Um, as far as making it through that, but no, it's absolutely, uh, astounding. She's not the only one. I have a couple of friends that have done that as well too, but I guess that depends on if you're going through the process of redefining who you both are emotionally together. Mm -hmm. then those people stand a little bit better of a chance making it together. And they use those people for like emotional and spiritual support. But again, with our unhealthy relationship tendencies, that tends to be the minority of people getting into recovery. So, right. Right. And congratulations on that's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's really awesome. Um, and you can do that together. I mean, I, I wouldn't suggest it, you know, some people can do it. Great. But Karen says after your, okay, I love this. Karen says after your first year, get a plant. After your second year, get a pet. If they're both alive after three years, you can go on a date. <laughs> Karen. I've heard that one before too. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Um, let's see. Jesse's okay. Wait, huh, da, da. Michael says he agrees with you and exactly what he said and exactly what you say. Um, Karen says on her birthday, she turned 42 and celebrated 22 years sober and clean. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's amazing. Um, and, you know, another thing is, is when we start to have these, you know, when we stop using substances and our emotions come up and we have to have these new emotional, um, we, have to, we have to find our emotions, we get vulnerable, right? And so it's really hard if we're not vulnerable with ourselves, how can we be vulnerable with someone else? You know? Um, and that's, that's my thing. You know, I mean, that's been so hard for me. Um, it's, it's really been, uh, even in my recovery, you know, getting vulnerable with someone. Um, but you know, I, it, it really helped me. Um, I mean, how do you feel about vulnerability and, and, and being vulnerable with someone is really hard. Yeah, especially for uh, a male of my social demograph. I come from the generation before me was the John Wayne bravado, men don't talk about their feelings kind of thing. Right. So that was extremely destructive to my emotional being, uh, especially dealing with a lot of the post-traumatic stress that I dealt with. Mm. Um, but that sincerity, you're talking about several other life skills that aren't generally taught in any institutions, either academically or just institutionally, like uh, having healthy and effective communication skills in a relationship, um, interpersonal relationship skills, so to speak, uh, being able to be emotionally vulnerable in, uh, in front of others without uh, letting things like fear of uh, judgment or lack of depreciated value mm -hmm. uh, basically distort your perception of, of how they're going to respond to that. Um, <clears throat> Me specifically, I like to, there's a specific quote in the Bible that I absolutely love when it comes to that. And it's like, uh, God's talking to Paul in a specific part of it. And he's talking about, um, I won't take my weak. God says to him, I won't take my weakness away from you because my strength is perfected in your weakness. And that reminds me a lot of the dynamics of relationships, uh, leading with your vulnerable and weak sides, uh, rather than trying to hide them right. because those tend to be like the connection points and bridges that draw you guys together, right. that emotional connection. Right. So, so let's say, right, we get sober, we get a plant for a year, we get a dog or a cat or an iguana for a year, right? And we start to go on dates and we, it's, it's, and dating is very scary, right? I mean, it's, it's intimidating. It's sometimes gonna be disappointing and be heartbreaking. It's scary. Uh, who, I mean, I have, I'm not a good, you know, poster child for this because I, uh, have not been a successful dater. What is, and I, I don't want to say like go into your love life or whatnot, but like, how have you been successful at that? What does that look like? And, um, 
I, yeah, you're what are you, you're gonna you're about to say something. Oh, I was just thinking I'm an open book. I'm fine with talking about any subject <laughs> matter you could possibly bring up. But uh, for me, I, so I had uh, the earlier parts of my 20s. I owned an entertainment company doing rap, hip hop, and R&B concerts all okay. over the Pacific Northwest. Cool. Um, I, I ran through several relationships during that gauntlet because there was the fame, fortune, all the notoriety that comes with it, all that stuff, right? Right. Uh, but uh, relationships of that nature left me yearning and searching for more on a much deeper level, mm-hmm. like an actual emotional uh emotional connection to the point of I was actually talking about it with my wife last night that mm-hmm. uh it literally feels like when you have that emotional bond and that connection with somebody that's truly significant right. they feel like your emotional center of gravity like despite the amount of chaos that's going on in your head or how insane life can get sometimes that it's breakneck pace and trying to handle everything they're they tend to be the grounding prod like and they don't have to do anything by being that uh outlet for you they just have to be your significant other. And some, somewhere deep down inside, you recognize that. Mm-hmm. And it's, they bring you back to, I guess, a uh, full circle, back into your head and put things in perspective and make you calm and serene, that type of thing. Right. And <sighs> yeah, I mean, it's so true. Dating and dating, obviously you're married, but dating is a trial and error process, right? And so you find that person that balances out your needs and can be that kind of center of balance when either you're going crazy, the other person's going crazy, you can be that center of balance for them. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go to the comments. Maria says she got a cat her second year. All right, great. Uh, congratulations. Um, Karen says when it comes to dating and relationships, when you're ready, everyone has their own red flags and you need to listen to them. That's so true, especially with you know, like the codependency part. I mean, we can start to rely on that person, put their needs ahead of ours. Um, you know, if we're not practicing a good program, I can I can creep back, you know, into our lives, those old behaviors, those old patterns. So, um, you know, like Tom said too, like focusing on ourself and putting that first. I mean, it's all kind of a, a pyramid, if you will. It kind of all adds up, right? Um, and we can start building on each little lesson that we learn. Um, Karen says, don't become a professional dater either. I know a couple of those in my life. <laughs> I, I've, I have a couple friends that are those, but um, let's see. <laughs> um, so Michael says, this is an interesting, okay. When you're clean, your sexual feelings come back to life, right? I, I feel like that's, for some of us, it's very true. Um, you know, those are some needs that we need to be at being intimate. And I know for some people that's very hard, you know, having sex sober, right? I mean, that can be a scary thing too. Um, you know, I know a lot of the time when I was doing that in, in active addiction, I was high or drunk or, um, but it, it really can be another emotional connection with that person. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it, sh- it definitely should involve some type of emotional connection. I feel like one of the yeah. biggest issues that we face with this generation is emotional detachment from sex mm-hmm. in its entirety. And mm-hmm. I say this because uh, several of the women specifically that I work with now uh, come from a, either human trafficking or like mm-hmm. sex trafficking type of thing. And uh, I can only imagine the amount of distorted self-worth that comes with the emotional detachment that it takes to, I guess, use your body as an instrument to like benefit from. Yeah. Um, I, on the grand scheme of things, I, I don't see any difference between that and like trafficking narcotics, for example, because when you're selling your physical body, the other one, you're selling your soul. So it's like tomato, tomato, same thing. But still, at the end of the day, I know exactly how that feels. So and I can't imagine anything good comes from it. So uh, uh, as far as like internal uh, things that you're trying to rebuild and basically the mm-hmm. overall thing is you want a healthy relationship. And a lot of us have no clue what a healthy relationship is. Right. And modeled it throughout various parts of our lives. Right. So, right. So let's say, you know, you get into a healthy relationship, right? Cause some, some of, some of the people watching are, um, how do you, I mean, there's different ways to, um, kind of balance that. Right. I mean, you have to learn about the other person. Right. And I think a good thing for people dating in recovery is that, we learn how to be of service to others. We learn how to, um, you know, listen to our, our own um, gut feelings. And so one other thing I wanted to bring up was there's a book and it's called The Five Love Languages, right? Um, and I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but um, 
you know, these, these are something that relationship counselors, therapists, and different people use, right, dealing with couples or um, people who are married, and it helps people understand each other more deeply. So in relationships, right, people's thinking, in relationships, every person's thinking and feeling is different. Every person's needs are different. Um, and so it's, it's so important to understand what your partner's needs are, right? But there's different ways that we can um, express love and express that to the other person. Have you had any kind of um, experience with, with the love languages at all or, you know, studied that? Absolutely. I've read the book from front to cover as well as the children's version. Oh, wow. The ch <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah. That so, has to do with raising children. I have three kids myself, so children okay. also display love languages. Yeah. <clears throat> so what, I mean, so, so we'll go over a couple of them. There's there's five of them. Um, so the first one is receiving gifts. So literally this is just something you hold in your hand and say like, this person was thinking of me, I'm giving you a gift and something that is thoughtful. And um, you know, it's just, it's just a symbol of thought, right? I mean, I've given flowers to people, gift, gift cards. I mean, what are some of the gifts that you've given to make people feel loved? Uh license plate covers all kinds of <laughs> yeah. just little knickknacks like little things I've, I've given flying that <sighs> yeah, yeah um <laughs> i guess i think so, on a much more deeper level the suggestion that comes behind that so <sighs> gifts yeah. isn't one of my love languages by the way <laughs> what's yours uh my two are positive affirmation and uh physical touch okay so tell tell us about positive affirmations a little bit uh, positive affirmations that ties into a whole different psychological principle. And that's essentially building people up. Um, statistically speaking in, uh, like, so this is just in general society. Uh, we hear one positive affirmation for every seven negative word, negative statements that are said to us. Mm -hmm. And when you go into the school system, it's not much better. Academically speaking, uh, one out of four statements said to a child is a positive affirmation. So it's no wonder that we walk around questioning whether or not we're valid or worthy when you look at those statistics. And that's specifically quoted from John C. Maxwell's book, Winning with People. Um, he talks about the self-perception and positive affirmation, the power that it has to help build you up. So the positive affirmation for me specifically, I think a lot of the lo your love languages has to do with how you're raised. Mm -hmm. And needless right. to say, growing up through my life, I never got a lot of positive attaboys and stuff like that from anybody in my family. So positive affirmation that I'm heading in the right direction or that I'm appreciated and stuff, all that stuff builds upon you. So like in how you feel invested into that relationship or how far you're willing to go or that you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. um, and that ties into everything from your job, your relationship, like how you conduct yourself in society, like positive affirmation is probably one of the greatest underscored things that we have as a society, because we should be in the habit of building people up rather than tearing them down. Especially on the internet, you know, I mean, it's, we're so easy behind a laptop or a phone to cut people down. It's so easy. <laughs> Keyboard warriors. Right, right. Um, Maria wants to know the name of the children's version of the book. Uh, I can't specifically remember the title. I know it's the same thing. It's love languages, yeah. but there's like a hyphen in it and it says children's edition. Ooh. And it basically goes over psychological principles. I actually took developmental psychology while I was going through Lewis and Clark state is pretty mad uh, okay. way back when I was not a fossil like I am now, but anyways, um, <laughs> You're it, not. It, it ties into some of those principles though, that it's yeah. talking about like how kids see you receiving gifts and it goes more into the, uh, integrity and modeling decent behavior for your children as it being a really like, so this is a big one mm -hmm. that uh, specifically there's households that they don't see how conflict resolution is done correctly. in. like, mm -hmm. it's okay for two adults to have opposing views and then handle that amicably and find right. resolution in it and have a healthy discussion. Right. Right. That's not necessarily modeled in every household. So <laughs> he was just talking about uh, the importance of that is basically you're teaching your children when you're modeling like, you know, uh, positive affirmations, how to build people up. When you're talking about acts of service, making people feel loved. When you're talking about quality time, investments in relationships. Like one of my personal issues is that once a relationship has been established, mm -hmm. I expect it to maintain itself without any more exerted energy into it right. after a long duration of time has gone by. So, which is contradictory to how work. marriage works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> marriage does not work that way. So, 
you got to continually invest said energy or love or emotion or time into that relationship to keep it value, uh, keep value in it. And like uh, everybody always thinks the grass is greener on the other side. Well, I think that's a good indication that it's time to water your own lawn. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So, well, and, and then you said um, your other love language is physical touch. So, I mean, you know, I, I think I think I always think of like, you know, babies that are, you know, babies when they're born being held, it's so important to, you know, when they grow older, I mean, rather than babies that are not held for long, I mean, it can, it can change their emotional, you know, stability and state as they grow older. Tell me a little bit about more about physical touch. Actually, a really interesting study was done uh, about that, in like, uh, I think 1960s that was based on, uh, they used Specifically, actually, this is a ban now in the United States, but they did testing with a baby orangutans, I believe it was, but it was physical touch versus like wire mesh outlines of what their mother was supposed to be and the psychological effects that come with it. And they were detrimental yeah. to say the least. Um, so physical touch is really important. And that doesn't just necessarily mean hanky panky. So calm down, folks. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> that, also, that also involves like, you know, kissing, holding hands, doing anything intimate like holding hands going on walks together like anything uh back and foot massages those type of things things mm -hmm. that are really uh copacetic for mental health as well as draw you physically and intimate intimately closer together right. right and and then there's also acts of service which you know not to be um confused with a gift right an act of service is something that you do like taking out the trash for someone or opening the door um, what, what do you, and I'm sure you have a lot of insight about that. Uh, specifically. So <clears throat> when me and my wife first got together, right, the mm -hmm. way she was raised is, uh, some of the issues she struggled with is recognizing acts of service as a version of love because her dad did a lot of, uh, you know, pay the bills, keep the house yeah. going, keep food in it, that type of thing, but didn't offer emotional support. So for mm -hmm. her specifically, uh, acts of service does not register as a level of love. So I can remember in the earlier parts of our marriage, our relationship actually prior to, to getting married, I would do cute little things like go vacuum out our car for and do these things, um, all kinds of things like keep the house clean, do the dishes, fold her laundry, all this type of stuff to take care of her. Basically in my head, I was symbolizing that I love her, but on her like love gas tank, so to speak, none of that was registering as, right. as me showing you that I love you. It was just maintaining the status quo. So that was basically me wasting my energy. So what, what we did is we both sat down with the book, identified our love languages. You guys both read basically, the book. What's that? You both read the book. Oh yeah. She's yeah. used to my uh, psychological banter. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's great. <clears throat> yeah. She and comes then... from the back. She's actually never been in, uh, been in recovery or, or I guess been in substance abuse uh, okay. or addiction or anything like that. But I feel like me personally, I think recovery is for everybody, not just recovery from substance right. abuse. I think, something predates your substance abuse. And that includes like trauma or just life or whatever. So I think recovery is more like the life skills that it teaches, the, the infrastructure that builds on recovery is for everybody. So she's highly involved in recovery herself, but hers right. is from like depression, anxiety, having a rough life, um, right. not being able to figure things out at a certain time, poor self body image, all those things that come with it. Right. I mean, I think everybody, I, I totally agree with you. Um, everyone can be in recovery from something, right? I mean, we're all kind of, we've all been through something, no matter if it's trauma, anxiety, depression, right? Substance abuse, but um, I'm veering off track a little bit. The last one is quality time. So, you know, and, and this isn't just like Netflix and chilling, right? Um, no, not <laughs> no what, what tell us? Uh, quality time for me is defined as uh, investing in, so uh, like there's, my, my wife likes go, goes to places like a uh, peanuts palette. So like you go drink a little bit of wine and paint. Oh, right. Um, paint. She likes to do like, you know, pottery or artistic things, which that's not my cup of tea, but I will certainly go with her because I see that as an investment in quality time, making her know that like, I care enough about her and her well being to go do mm -hmm. things I might not be thrilled with, but that's part of being in a relationship because you're right. willing to make those sacrifices. That right. to me is quality time. Right. <sighs> wow. Well, this has been so great. And um, I just, I mean, is there, so if you're watching the replay, thank you for watching. We appreciate you. Um, 
is there anything else that you want to add? I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's so much you can add. I mean, you've been such a value to um, this live tonight. Anything else? <laughs> <My pleasure>. Anytime. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I would just say that specifically that we, a lot of us, so it's like a psychological principle, so to speak, that okay. when we look at ourselves on camera or a picture, it adds five to 10 pounds, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's to say that the same thing isn't true of your internal being your emotional view of yourself mm -hmm. so the first thing i'd primarily say to everybody is give yourself a break like the reality and perception you have of yourself and the way other people view you is probably drastically different so like for me uh, that means that i automatically start any assumptions or anything like that fundamentally knowing that my perspective is flawed from the get-go mm -hmm. so that gives you a little bit of room to wiggle with as far as uh you know, how preconceived notions and judgments and how you feel about yourself, give yourself a break and realize there's a lot more to it than that. Right. Um, focus more on your self-worth, building up your self-esteem so you can be somebody that's healthy. Like, cause I, I gotta be honest, being a, a really good husband and a really good father is extremely difficult. Like seriously, labor intensive to the max. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't realize how much was quite entailed in shaping little humans mm -hmm. until I got a couple of my own and started parenting right for the real world like right. on the real terms, like emotionally sculpting them, so to speak. So I've always done Another that life. in the past during my addiction, it was like that Disney dad, like ah, I'll pay child support and I'm out though. Like no quality right. time type of thing. Right. So <clears throat> those are really important virtues and characteristics to have. So right. we, that's another, we should do parenting. Okay. We all, all mm. back that's on. a really good topic. Then um, one comment I just want to add, Dee, Dee says she's never been on a date sober She's scared to death and she doesn't know, she won't know what to do. Please tell me it's all gonna come back just like riding about riding a bike. She's been six years single and 20 months sober. Good for you on your sobriety. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think Didi, you have to just step through that fear. You know, it's scary, um, but you know, you did the hardest thing ever, get sober, right? So meeting someone and I'm sure you are funny. You're, I'm sure, you know, you're adventurous. I, I'm sure you've got great qualities about you that someone will love. Um, but, you know, walk through that fear. Make sure you do the, do the work on yourself first. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much, Tom. Um, this is so great. I'm really, I'm really excited that we had you on. Um, if you're watching the replay, thank you guys so much. If you are struggling or need someone to talk to, send us a message. Um, if you want to write for Sober Nation, send me an uh, email or send us a message. Um, you can always submit your sober story on our website. Um, we will be back again next week, Thursday night, same time, 9 p.m., and Veronica will probably be here. So, um, But thank you again, Tom. I really appreciate it, and um, we hopefully we'll see you again, definitely. I would love to talk on any topic you possibly have. And for everybody out there, if nobody's told you today, I love you. And I, I just want to let you know, too, my mom at, just sent me a text message and asked if we could clone you um, because you're very well spoken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nine and a half years of college education will do that. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, have a good Valentine's Day, everyone. Have a good night. We'll see you next week. Bye. Much love, everybody.